Good morning, Cornerstone. Good morning, John. Will you pray with me? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is filled with your glory. We come together this morning to magnify your name and to worship you in spirit and in truth and to make a special request of you today. Father, that you would look on the people of Tennessee and Georgia and Florida and Virginia, North Carolina and South Carolina as so many lives have been torn apart, so many cities have been washed away, as calamity has visited our shores, we pray, Lord God, that you would give comfort, that you would give help and hope to those who are in desperate need. Pray that your glory would be revealed even through this catastrophe. Pray that your will will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. As I've been reading back and forth through the book of Exodus, I cannot help but be convicted. As I read about the astonishing faith of the children of God, can't help but be convicted as I watch them as they travel, not knowing where they're going, wandering in the wilderness. I can't help but feel convicted by that. And I cannot help but feel encouraged when I read a text like the one we're studying today. We already know from two weeks ago that at God's first call to Moses, Moses protested and he asked God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I? Why are you sending me of all of the people you could send? Why would you send me? Who am I? And God says to Moses, don't worry, I will be with you. It's not about who you are, it's about who I am. I will be with you, so now go. But Moses protests again. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute, not yet, hold on just a minute. What is your name? I need some more information. What is your name? When I go to them, they're gonna ask me what your name is. So, so who shall I tell them sent me? And God gave Moses his name. He said, I am that I am. This will be my name throughout the generations. Tell them I am has sent you. Now, I hope all your questions are answered now, Moses. And I, I promise you that when you go to the elders and you give them my name, chapter 3, verse 18, they will pay attention to you. Don't worry. I've got this. And you will say to the king of Egypt, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But listen to what God says, verse 19 of chapter 3. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. I'm sending you, Moses, to deliver a message, to give some instruction and my command, but I already know that Pharaoh is not going to heed your call unless I force him to. So I will reach out with my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, after I get finished, he will let you go. I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. It shall be that when you go, you will not go empty handed, but every woman shall ask her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house for articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And you will put them on your sons and your daughters. So you will plunder the Egyptians. I have to say, I've been walking with the Lord for a number of years now. I have never received such clear instruction from God in all of my days of walking with him. I have never received the entire plan all at the same time. God gives this concession to Moses because Moses is nervous. And God gives him the entire plan. God has already worked out all of the details. All of the bases are covered. All Moses needs to do now is just go. But then Moses protests again. Now we begin to see a pattern with Moses. There's something wrong with him. There's something about his question that feels like procrastination. There is a hint of uncertainty in his words and in his tone. Can you discern what Moses' problem is? Can you hear it? Well, before we diagnose Moses' problem, let's first consider the challenge and this call that God is placing on his life. God is calling Moses to go and present himself before the elders of the Jews, a people who has already soundly rejected him, a people who knows his dirty little secrets, who know his vulnerabilities. God is asking Moses to go and submit himself to their judgment. God is commanding Moses to present himself to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, a violent government who could have him arrested for crimes of, of murder. Murder he committed 40 years ago. God is calling Moses to risk imprisonment, or even the death penalty. Not only that, God is commanding Moses to risk throwing away the life that he's built in the desert of Midian. 
He's calling Moses to leave his house, to liquidate whatever wealth he's acquired, to possibly abandon his wife and his children. God is calling Moses to risk losing it all. It is a daunting calling. It is an intimidating prospect. Let me ask you the question, has God ever intimidated you? Has God ever required you to voluntarily walk away from something that you love? Something that you've built, something that you've nurtured and accomplished. Has God ever intimidated you with the largesse of his calling to abandon your dreams, to follow his purpose? It's a daunting thought. Francis of Assisi was born with a silver spoon in his mouth in the 16th century. As a young man, he traveled and he drank and he partied and he lived a carefree life. And then Jesus Christ found Francis. And Francis felt the call of God to pursue a life of poverty, to give away all of his wealth, to spend the rest of his life serving lepers and repairing churches, and preaching about the love of God. That's a daunting calling. George Muller, 19th century, George Muller felt the call of God to abandon his career and start an orphanage. He had no money, he had no property, but he obeyed the call of God. It was a daunting calling. And George Muller lived the rest of his days by faith alone, living paycheck to paycheck, depending on the generosity of those with wealth. To follow the call of God, it was a daunting, intimidating calling. Has God ever challenged you in this way? To walk out on nothing but faith alone, to walk away from everything that you know, everything that you have, to take a risk with no contingencies, with no plan B, just go. Moses knows that once he presents himself in Egypt, he will be at the mercy of people who may not even like him. He will be at the mercy of a Pharaoh who has the power to annihilate him. People who may resent him, he knows this. It is a daunting proposition. It is a challenge that is best overcome by great faith. There are at least seven kinds, seven types of faith that we can conclude from scripture. First, there is the measure of faith found in Romans chapter 12, verse three. That is the saving faith that every child of God has and has experienced, the, the measure. To each one is given a measure of faith. Another type of faith is a dead faith. A dead faith is found in James chapter 2, verse 17, that faith that is without works. Simple belief. It's the kind of faith that does nothing and says nothing. The kind of faith that risks nothing, that stands for nothing. Dead faith. The kind of faith that keeps its eyes toward the clouds, paralyzed by the prospect of getting involved with the goings-on in this world, just waiting for Jesus. Dead faith. The kind of faith that hides its talents instead of investing God's treasures. It makes no waves. It evades spiritual confrontation at all costs. It's a basement kind of faith. That's what I call it, basement faith. Faith that is hiding from the challenges of this world. Then there is that growing faith that all of us have. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. A faith that continues to grow and to mature the longer we walk with God. All of our faith should be growing faith. Then, then there's genu gen genuine faith. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, a sincere faith. This kind of faith may be great, it may be small, but whatever the size of it, the person who has this kind of faith sincerely believes to the extent they do believe. All of our faith should be genuine faith. Then there is that unwavering faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, a faith that holds firmly without questioning and without second-guessing God. Standing firmly, standing squarely on the word of God with no trace of doubt, with no whisper of impatience, no fluctuating, unwavering faith and commitment to God. Then there's the greatest faith found in Matthew chapter 8 verse 10 where Jesus declares concerning that centurion man. He says, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Great faith. This is the kind of faith that we all want, right? Great faith. The faith where all we need is a word from God to hold on to, that's all we need. His words are enough to satisfy our longing, to give us confidence to withstand the greatest trials, the greatest storms. Great faith. Faith is the substance of the thing we hope for even though we cannot see. Faith is the confidence that whatever God has promised, he is willing and he's able to perform it. All God has to do is say it and we sincerely believe that it will be done and we move by faith. But that great philosopher Mike Tyson created a saying. Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. In a very similar way, every child of God has great faith 
until they experience the trials and the storms of life. This is where faith is tried. This is where faith is proven in the midst of calamity, in the midst of pain and of loss, in the darkness of the shadows of death. The woman with the issue of blood had her faith tried when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. And she was proven to have great faith. Job's faith was tried when he lost all that he had. And Job demonstrated genuine faith. And even Jesus Christ's faith was tried. As he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he displayed a great faith. In our text today, Moses is being tried. Unlike Daniel, Moses is not being thrown into the lion's den. Moses is being called to walk into the lion's den voluntarily. To go to the elders and to go to Pharaoh and declare the words of the Lord. It's daunting. And then Moses said, chapter 4, verse 1, Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. What if? What if? Who can overrate the power of these two simple words? What if? By these two words, kingdoms have been built. What if? By these two simple words, riches has been lost. What if? Because of what if thinking, poor men have become rich. Yet because of this same, these same two words, rich men have become poor. What if thinking? It can activate the imagination and allow you to think outside the box. But what if thinking can also paralyze you? What if thinking can neutralize your potential to grow? What if? Moses standing here before God, paralyzed, incapacitated by the fear of the unknown, disabled by the sheer possibility of failure and rejection. What if? Wait a minute, God. What if? What if they will not listen to me? What if they say the Lord has not sent you? Then, then what? But if you go back to chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, you recall that God just gave Moses the entire plan. God just told Moses how the entire thing is going to unfold. Number one, you're going to tell the elders my name and they're going to listen to you. Number two, you're going to ask the king of Egypt to let you go and he's not going to do it. He's going to deny you. Then I am going to compel him with miracles and then he will let you go and I am going to give the Hebrews favor and they're going to plunder the Egyptians' riches and they're going to leave Egypt. I already told you the whole, but what if? No what ifs about it. That's what's going to happen, Moses. I've already told, I just told you this. But Moses is struggling to believe it because Moses has little faith. Little faith is the kind of faith that can see great signs and wonders and still not be firmly convinced. Moses has little faith. But without doubt, most of us in this room have little faith. Without controversy, most believers around the world have little faith. It is only maybe once or twice in a generation that you see a believer arise who demonstrates great faith. How many do you know? And for the rest of us, we continue to teeter on the fence between faith and doubt and hope and fear. But I've not come this morning to criticize yours or my little faith. Instead, I have come to encourage us to believe that while God would be best served by great faith, that our God is patient. And God will meet you where you are with whatever measure of faith you may possess. This is what he did for Moses, and he'll do the same thing for you and for me. The Lord said to Moses, what is that in your hand? And Moses said, a staff, a stick. Then God said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground. It turned into a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, reach out with your hand and grasp it by its tail. So Moses reached out with his hand and caught it, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. And this is what God says, so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. That's why I gave you this stick, this staff to turn into a snake so they'll believe. But again, mm -mm, again, if you go back to chapter three, verses 18 through 22, God mentioned nothing about a staff. I wonder, has anybody ever noticed this before? God mentioned nothing about a staff. A staff wasn't even in the picture. He only said that Moses would tell the elders his name and they would believe him. But Moses is not able to trust that it could possibly be that easy. So God complicates it for him. You find it hard to believe it can be that easy. Let me make it more complicated for you. What is that in your hand? Most of us have the same problem that Moses had. We have a hard time believing that things could work out so easily. 
that all we need to do is believe and to speak and we will have whatever we say. We find that difficult to believe. We need it more complicated. You see, faith is so straightforward. Faith is so simple. But we are complicated. And because of our own complexities, we make the Christian life and we make the Christian walk much more complicated than it was ever designed to be. And so because God recognizes the impediment of doubt in Moses' personality, he doesn't stop with a staff. God gives Moses another unnecessary security blanket to hold on to, to protect him from things that go bump in the night. God gives Moses another unnecessary security. Yeah, Moses' staff was unnecessary. I never realized that before. He didn't need a staff. That staff was for his own security, to make him feel like he was empowered. Because he couldn't just trust the words of God all by themselves. What's that in your hand? Okay, let's turn into a snake, okay? You feel better now? You got some power now? Listen, and that same staff is going to turn around and be the reason he can't go into the promised land because of his doubt, because of that impediment. But the Lord's not finished. The Lord furthermore said to Moses, now put your hand inside. I wish I could have been there to see this. Now put your hand inside the fold of your robe. So Moses put his hand inside the fold, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Okay, nothing happened, but thank God. <laughs> like snow. Then God said, put your hand inside your, the fold of your robe again. So he put it in his hand inside the fold again, and when he took it out, the fold, and behold, it was restored like the rest of it. Amazing, wow. Moses standing here before a, a bush that is burning but is not being consumed, and this just blows his mind here. This is amazing, man. I got a stick that turns to a snake, and my hand can turn white, then turn back brown again. This is, this is too much. So God says, if they will not believe nor pay attention to the evidence of the first sign, they may believe the evidence of the last sign. But if they will not believe even these two signs, nor pay attention to what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will turn into blood on the dry ground. God is just accommodating Moses' lack of faith. When you read these words in light of chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, you can get a glimpse of the God's sense of humor in even doing all of this. God already knows exactly what he's going to do. He already said it. He already knows that those elders are going to listen to Moses if he tells them his name. Notice when he goes to the elders later, he's not going to turn his hand to leprosy. He's not going to throw a stick on the ground. He's just going to tell them what God said, and they're going to obey. And then, then, when he throws his staff down like magic, and it turns to a snake, guess what? Pharaoh's people throw down sticks and do the same thing. This is nothing. This is just God accommodating Moses' weakness. Yeah, here's a stick. Make you feel better? Good. Damn, your hand can turn colors. Make you feel better? Good. It's not necessary, but I'm accommodating your little faith. God is accommodating your little faith. God knows the end from the beginning. God already knows how Pharaoh is going to respond. And that renowned staff that Moses was carrying throughout the rest of the book of Exodus, that staff was nothing more than a crutch. A crutch that God provided for Moses to compensate for his lack of faith. What is your crutch? What is your crutch? God's will would have been done the same way with the staff or without the staff. God's will would have been done the same without the leprosy or with the leprosy. By turning water into blood or not, it didn't even matter. It was Moses who needed those signs. And I thank God that he was patient enough, accommodating enough to entertain Moses' doubts. Maybe you need a sign from God today. Maybe you sense that God is asking you to take some risks, to make some changes, but you're uncertain. As much as I talk about Moses and his little faith and his protesting, I have to say this, at least Moses was honest with God. That's more than most of us can say. I think it was eight years ago now, seven or eight years ago, however long I've been at this church, when the elders asked me to come and be the pastor of this church. The superintendent of the Christian Missionary Alliance called me to congratulate me on the good news. I'll never forget that night. Well, brother, they, uh, the elders have invited you to become the pastor of the church. <clears throat> and Superintendent John at the time, he was a pretty discerning guy. We were talking and he said, Calvin, you don't sound very excited about that. You don't sound excited about becoming the pastor. <laughs> I said, well, no, not, not, not particularly. He said, well, why don't you pray about it and see what the Lord is saying? I didn't want to pray about it. I'm like, I, I know what the Lord is saying. I know what I'm saying. 
And I went walking the next day, and I was trying to figure out why. Since I was 13 years old, I've known I was going to be a pastor. But when the door opened, I was like, no, nope, no thank you. And I couldn't figure out why. And I'm walking, I'm talking to God, and, and nothing is coming up. I go home, I get on my knees, I'm just sitting on my knees quiet, not saying, I didn't know what to say, so I'm just on my knees waiting. And when I finally started talking, I said, God, I don't mind becoming a pastor, but I have to be honest with you. I don't know that I trust you enough to do this. Those were some of the most painful words I've ever said. I just broke down. I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I said that. I'm not sure I trust you enough to do this. And the dam broke. The Bible says, they that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. Tell God the truth. Just say the truth. I would, but I'm really not certain about you in this one. We've walked together a long ways, but I tell you, I've got some scars and some wounds. I'm not sure I feel like that anymore, Lord. I, just, I don't know about that one. And the Holy Spirit began to minister to me that day. Say, good, now you're ready to go to work. Because now you're not just practicing religion, which I hate. Now you're actually telling me the truth. Now we can work it out. And God worked it out. Be honest with God. Be honest with yourself and be honest with God, even right now. When you pray to God, tell God what's really on your mind, what you're actually thinking. Most of us, brothers and sisters, are, I don't want to go there. M most of us are wearing masks. And we wear the mask even when we go into prayer. And we're sitting before God with a mask on. And we wonder why we're not being heard. Take off the mask, tell God the truth, and let God heal you. Moses was at least willing to be honest. Yes, I see your power, I see your fire in the bush, but what if? I'm not sure about this. Wait, what if? At least he was willing to say it. Most of us wouldn't even be willing to say it. We would just ignore it. Because we don't want to say, I have my doubts about this one, God. I have some doubts about this. I'm not sure about you on this one. Because we feel like that would be so irreverent. And God is saying to you today, I already know what you're thinking. If you really trust me, you can say it. You're not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> you can't hurt me. But when you come truthfully before me, when you tell me the truth, I can begin to work with you to help you to develop beyond that. But as long as you're just playing religion, and our Father who I'm being, yeah. You're still going to heaven, but you, you're not going to be very useful down here. They that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and tell the truth and let God work with you <laughs> to give you the crutch that you need but, but, but don't stay on the crutch for the rest of your life after a while you should grow and that was Moses' problem Moses didn't grow beyond that crutch at a certain point he should have put that staff to the side I don't even need that staff anymore I can just speak it works the same way with the stick or without the stick I don't need a stick but he never grew beyond it and that stick ended up costing him access to the promised land when he smote the rock with the stick that God gave him as a crutch. Yeah. I guess my message to us today is simply this. Be encouraged to know that whatever size of faith you have, whether your faith is great, whether your faith is small, that we serve a God who loves us enough, who's patient enough to make up the difference in our lives. Let's pray. Great is your faithfulness, Lord God, to us. Great is your patience and your mercy and your love for us. We thank you, Father God, for meeting us where we are, for loving us as we are. And we pray today, Father God, not for more faith, but that you would give us more trust in you. More trust to know that you are a loving God. And there's nothing that we can do to cause you to love us less. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your willingness to accommodate our weaknesses. Help us to submit ourselves to you all the more each and every day. Have your way in our lives. Give us the courage, the confidence, and the faith to answer your call on our lives. The willingness, the ability to take great risks for your glory so that your name will be praised throughout the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.